All right, hey everyone, welcome to the latest class. This is the US Chess School. Uh, we're very happy to have international master Alex Ostrovsky here. This is his first time uh, teaching in the new session and his first time in the dojo. So welcome, Alex. Oh, thank and, you so uh, much. Yeah, so the this monthly um, series that has been going on is uh, learning from our, our losses. Every coach has been asked to kind of prepare some instructive uh, lessons from games that they lost. And without any further ado, I will throw it uh, to Alex. Well, thank you very much, Kostin. I'm glad to be back with all my good U.S. chess school friends here. I haven't seen you guys in a while. I want to try to look at if we have any usual suspects here. Looks like some new, some old. Okay. Anyhow, so yeah, the theme of the, of the month, the theme of all these lessons is... Um, Losses or draws, very important, because I told Greg, I was like, you know, I don't really lose any games. So it's going to be a very difficult assignment for me. Thankfully, there were some draws as well, though, so I was able to squeeze those in. So, yeah, from what I understand, um, our coach's job, we want to show you guys some of our um, instructive losses and draws and potentially uh, something that we, uh, that we can learn from them. And um, in this case, what I particularly learned from some of these, uh, some of these games and uh, I'm saying this, I, I know I, was, I joke a lot, as you guys know, but I say this unironically. I found so many games where I make all these horrible mistakes, and I was like, man, I wish I could really pick out a game where I, I learned from this. But it just looks like I never really learn. But, you know, with that being said, hopefully you guys will at least be able to learn from this and not repeat necessarily some of my mistakes. Okay, the main problem that I have in most of my games when they um, end unsuccessfully is um, it all stems from the same same reason. It is my time management. Now, I'm sure there are some players here. We do have, you know, relatively robust squad here that also have had games where it was decided by some unfortunate end of game clock issue and uh, definitely has been a major problem for me for many, many, many years, uh, blowing, winning and, and, uh, and good positions. And yeah, as we have in the chat, we have uh, people, people have already seen here in, in my US chess school chat, they've already seen some of these uh, terrible, terrible games. But nevertheless, I still, um, still found quite a, couple examples which uh quite embarrassing to be honest but also um you know i'm kind of kind of over them so we'll, we'll look at them some of these i have shown before um even in the u.s chess schools but it's been quite some time plus we always have different players so hopefully there is going to be some stuff i can show you guys which you haven't also seen before but anyway without further ado um, let's um let's go through this game this game i played um what is it 2017 so quite some time ago um i guess a decent player master level player let's get on with it so um, I'll breeze through the opening a little bit, stopping where we kind of need to just for your instructional value. All of this stuff is theoretical um, in the classical caro. This is all mainline. And uh, I've actually done some kind of lesson on this at some point on this end game. And uh, so some of you guys may remember this. But um, the position kind of goes all the way up until move 18. I've had this position um, back in the day maybe, maybe something like seven times. So this is certainly one of the... Uh, uh, even though it's 18 moves deep, it is a position that is unfam not unfamiliar to me. And uh, a little bit of also context for this game. Now, obviously, I'm trying to win regardless, as I am um, the high-rated player by 200 points here. But this was also the last round of the tournament. I think I had something like, I don't remember, I was in good position. Um, so a win here was giving me something like first or second place or something like that. So uh, definitely an important game for the standings. And for my opponent, I mean, it's not necessarily that he's playing for a draw or something like that, even though we're in this endgame. Um, you know, White also has some things if you flip the board to be excited about. He has a little bit more space. Um, but other than that, he doesn't really have much to boast about as I have a pretty robust position. And um, so, um, yes, yeah, someone's already telling me they know the move here. Yeah, the move here that I played, it's not the only move, but the move that I like to use in this position uh, is the move F5. Now, um, well, I could have actually asked this before I made the move, but I guess we'll do it the other, uh, the other way around. So uh, let's see if... Um, um, yeah, what is what is uh, the point of this move for me? Because obviously it looks tremendously ugly to weaken the five square and the six square, but um, why did I play it? And uh, I guess we'll still operate under the same uh, same principle that you write something in the chat, and then I think I have the capabilities to unmute you. I yeah, I so Alex is actually talking to the kids in the Zoom chat. Um, I'm here to interact with Twitch. All right, so just to reiterate, question is, why am I playing this F5 move? I know it looks bad. Okay, so 
this one I'm not going to call anyone yet because you guys obviously see that I'm threatening F4. But what's, let's say white is also vigilant and he sees that I'm trying to play F4 and just goes G3. So G3 is a very obvious response. It's not the move that he played, actually. But if he plays G3, it looks like my whole F5 idea is for nothing. Uh, terrible weaknesses on the E5 square. Terrible weakness on the E6 square. It's like, uh, you know, it's starting to look like a, you know, bullet cheapo uh, if he plays G3. So that's, what's the real idea there? All right. Oh, I forgot we did this. Um, yeah, yeah. We If you want to be called on, you got to put the exclam. I forgot about that. Okay, so who's this? Um, all right, Aryan. Yeah. Yeah, would you like so to if, share your answer? Yeah, so if G3, I like bishop to G5 because basically I'm putting pressure on your center. In F2 pawn. So if you take with the knight, G takes. And then black has a very solid position and white has some weaknesses. It seems like black's pressing here. Okay, thank you very much. And indeed, a couple of other players here also said bishop to G5. That's actually the real secret sauce in the position here. After bishop G5, there's actually some uncomfortable problems for white here. The immediate threat is to take on F2 due to the pin on the bishop. And then if you take back on G5, well, if you take with the bishop, pawn takes, then you still have to deal with this threat. And if you take with the knight, then there's this really interesting imbalance here where when this pawn gets to g4, I'm able to solidify the structure. The knight on e4 is in a de facto outpost because it cannot be removed by pawns. And um, it adds some imbalance to the position that makes it very plausible to um, play for a positive result. So, um, yeah, this f5 move is very concrete. Concrete meaning that it's justified by very specific, um, specific factors of the position. And uh, okay, obviously I'm not a, I'm not a genius to come up with this move over the board. It's something that the computer sees and uh, has been pretty well established as an interesting move to try to unbalance the game here. So my opponent, I don't not sure if he was familiar with this move, but he spent some time here and he played it very safe. Again, no G3, no, nothing too wild. He just plays knight to a uh, knight to D2, offering the trade of knights. And um, I play bishop F6, bishop C3, and uh, play rook to D8. Okay, um, again, I know some of you um, have. Uh, written here oh yeah i kind of remember this i um i think uh, i think i saw something like this before but um again uh no, i think uh, i think there's enough new people here that we can pose some of these familiar questions so the question here to you guys that i want to throw is what do you guys think about this position do we think uh you know it's just completely equal uh maybe white is still better because of the uh, structure um does black have anything going maybe just uh come up with some plans for white or black i'll even slap on a timer um for old time's sake. You guys know I love putting the timer here, although I need to make sure you guys can see it. Uh, maybe I can't really put it. Eh, okay, you guys see it over here, and uh, eh, maybe two and a half minutes is enough to get your thoughts in order. Um, all right, so very open-ended question. Um, you know, just what do you think about this position? Plans for both sides? Any chances for anyone to do anything positive? And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there. Hey, Nor. So what do we think about this position? E6 pawn is obviously kind of a weakness and on an open file, but so is the D4 pawn. And black has a better bishop here in terms of the center, right? We can put the bishop on F6, double the rooks on the D file, and white will be forced to defend this one. Um, yeah, exactly. It came from uh, Karo Khan. Uh, the question is simply, how do we evaluate the position uh, with white to move? Let's add that to everyone.
You guys like be you guys like white because of the space. But yeah, I really like this weakness on d4. So for me, this bishop on. Remember, if you want to get called on, put an exclam. If you're one of the lucky, lucky winners, you'll get to speak. Otherwise, you're going to be doomed to sit in silence for the rest of the uh, duration. Until the next question, at least. But I can imagine black playing bishop f6 and then even All right, c5. You also, do your best not to spam. If you can concisely send a message, that would be way more appreciated than seven different messages. d5 is another idea for black. For sure. Because either white plays b3 and then you can kind of weaken the queen side or white takes on b5 because all right let's see we get the d5s let's see what all the genuses have to say just reading reading up seeing who to call on you are still welcome to send additional information if you would like to do so. Um, okay, let's... Uh... Personally, I would take black. I also like that our king is closer mm. to the center. No exclaim here. Yes, exclaim here. All right, why not? Let's, uh, oh, that says no exclaim. Where are all my exclaims? Where are all you guys? You guys are all very shy today. Maybe, maybe I'll just need to, uh, I just need to throw it to emergency. Emergency. Greg answer is gonna is it's gonna be, because people are way too shy. Pick me. I don't even remember your answer, Ayan. And I just called on you, so I don't feel like I'm going to be calling on you twice. All right. Well, <laughs> I guess I can. I guess I can call on Aryan again just for the, just for the heck of it. All right. Why not? Why not? Okay, wait. Oh, wait. And we got a new answer. But no exclam. Uh, way too shy. You guys got to speak up. All right, let's go with... Um, I mean... Wait, hold up. Um, yeah. If nobody, if nobody writes the exclam... Well, I'm just going to cold call. I was just going to go for it. People, yeah. <laughs> you cannot escape my clutches. All right, here we go. Denial. You are getting cold called. But you did send an answer, so you set yourself up. Hello? Oh, there yeah, you. I hear you. Cool. Yeah, I said sure in the chat. I forgot about X then. Oh, um, my bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all true. Um, yeah, to be honest, I, I'm still kind of thinking why you went into this endgame. I don't see how you were playing for an advantage, but I think most likely it's going to be white will play like king c2, rook d3, rook d1, and you'll go for like bishop f6 and maybe rook d7, rook d8. And one day, like, you want to make c5 happen, but I don't see how that's going to happen. b5 doesn't really seem like a break you can do either. So long term, it seems like one of those Karpov games where white destroys black. I don't really see how you're going to do anything. Okay, well, uh, all right. That was a very, uh, you know, I'll, I'll agree and disagree with parts of that. Um, but okay, thank you for stepping up for the uh, the honor of the class and participating. So, okay, there's there's actually one thing that's quite interesting that I should address. There's a good question. It's like, okay, if you're trying to win, why are you in this position? Well, the truth is, um, you know, sometimes there, there's two sides to this. Of course, I could have played something a little differently, a little bit more confrontational, but whatever. The time of the game um, is kind of just petered out into this position. And, you know, from an objective standpoint, sometimes when you're playing black um, in your repertoire, there are just some lines that, like, for example, equalize, but maybe don't necessarily lead to um, very aggressive positions. I'm not saying I went into this being, okay, this is a, I need to win this game. This is the perfect line to, to get it done. Uh, far from it. Um, it just kind of, you know, I played this F5 move, and then it was just kind of one of the most aggressive moves I can play in the end game, and we kind of stumbled into here. So it's not like this is my preferred position to play, but um, 
Uh, that, that's to address that first part. But the rest, um, of course, uh, very reasonable. Obviously, white can go like rook d3, rook d1, just kind of safeguard d4, bring the king up the board. And um, obviously, black also has potential opportunity to put pressure on the d4 pawn and maybe at some point look to advance something on the uh, on the queen side. So uh, the thing that I, I said I was going to disagree from, disagree with, excuse me, was these classical Karpov games. Now, if you guys know, um, obviously, Anatoly Karpov is not... Uh, not a stranger to any of us, I'm sure. But um, he had a lot of these uh, famous games back in the 70s and 80s where he would win in this Karakon endgame. But the thing here is, compared to those endgames, whether you are or not familiar with them, um, the there's just much fewer pieces on the board. So in a lot of these games, he would be able to put a knight on e5, put this pawn on like f3, g4, and then a lot of times the d and c pawn would get exchanged. I, it's a lot to visualize, but I'm just going to kind of throw that out there. And then White would end up having three on two on the queen side, and slowly he would press, you know, and squeeze the opponent to, to death. But here, it's that's not the situation, because there's not that many pieces on the board. White doesn't have any pawn majority, and um, yeah, it's, it's just a little bit different. So anyhow, uh, this position is obviously roughly equal, but believe it or not, I was actually feeling uh, quite um, comfortable here. So I played um, rook, uh, bishop f6, rook d7, rook comes to d8. And uh, white sort of does everything. F basically, everything happens that some of you guys were talking about, particularly um, uh, Denial was telling us about this plan for both sides. And um, yeah, as a lot of people have alluded to, I was feeling quite nice here because this pawn on d4 is, I mean, it's just one sort of target. It's not necessarily even like a major weakness, but it is something that requires white to defend and use all his resources to sort of uh, keep, keep uh, my activity at bay. And of course, the question is, okay, am I going to be able to push any of these pawns forward? So what I do here first is I just play b6. What does this do? Well, I'm eyeballing maybe c5. More or less, I'm just kind of waiting and seeing what he's going to do. He plays a4. So he's really worried about me potentially playing b5. Okay, maybe that's a little bit presumptuous. Maybe he, he's not really worried about it. This is a decent move to gain some space. And I play a6, and he plays b3. Um... Okay, let me uh, double check something real quick. Okay. Um, all right, so I got to this position, which is more or less something that I was uh, anticipating when we kind of traded the knights. And of course, it's relatively dry, but uh, the play is, is, uh, is not over yet. I'm also having a question. Uh, the question is, what if white plays f4? I think white, because I guess black can also play f4. But uh, I'm assuming that's a question for white, because I think you wrote about that earlier as well. So... Um, I guess the idea for white to play something like f4 would be to prevent any ideas e of e5. Although, to be fair, I'm not really um, in much of a position to play e5 as of right now. But there are certain problems with f4, which we'll get into in a moment. Because I want to throw another question um, uh, your way. And again, keep in mind that, okay, if I want to draw, I probably just do nothing. And just like move my rug back and forth or my king, take your pick. But um, I'm still trying to generate some kind of, you know, some kind of positive chances. So I'll throw you guys, again, another timer. And um, same rules. Come up with a plan. Send an exclam. Even if you don't send an exclam, you still might get called on. So uh, pick your poison. But okay, black to play. Um, we're not winning here, but let's try to come up with a way to outplay the opponent. I'll also go to be right back to refill my water. Okay, black to play, huh? So I guess if... If we're trying to still play for a win here, right, playing for some advantage, then you know, general wisdom is to try to create a second weakness or start playing on the other flank. So we could say that the d-pawn is one weakness, and one idea we could do um, is just the simple move g6. Just trading off the g-pawns and opening up the, the g-file. Because then maybe we'll keep our king either on, probably on f7, uh, and maybe we can push our pawn to like h5, h4, rook can come to g8, and we can try to put some pressure on g2. Um, so if white had already played f4, and we went g6, then f4 and, and the g-pawn are a little bit weak. Now white can never play like g3 to, to strengthen the pawn. Black can also play like bishop g5, right, just attacking the rook, but... After rook d3, we would need to come up with another another idea there. Definitely a tough position to <laughs> to create anything here, um, but 
Yeah, my guess would be g6 is kind of the only plan, only plan we have. Okay. Okay, time to read some brilliant minds working at their best. Okay, okay. All right, so let me, I'm actually going to call on more than one person, I think. Let me call on, um, let me call on Troy. Mr. Troy, I'm trying to unmute you. All right, so my idea was to shuffle around the king, eventually going to E8. Um, and they have to do a move, which is um, forcing the king to B2 or work D3. Maybe we can put an A5 in there. And then our idea is plus C5, trade into a king and pawn end game. Because when the king is on b2, they can take on c3 with check and force him to a king and pawn game. So that's an idea. Okay, so I don't know if all you guys called that, but basically what Troy's saying, he's like, okay, I kind of want to wait around and uh, bide my time and at the right moment try to strike with c5 and liquidate into a pawn game that hopefully is going to be in my, uh, in my favor or something along those lines. So that is, I mean, this position aside, um, Sometimes you can do something along those lines, just kind of wait it out, just kind of shuffle around a little bit and wait for your opponent to kind of make some kind of mistake. That's kind of what I did in the past couple of moves when I kind of was setting up my pawns here. Now, of course, there were some underlying ideas of potentially some kind of pawn push, but I was also kind of trying to wait him out and see if he was going to do any kind of decision that might backfire. But at this point, you know, um, first of all, getting into the pawn end game isn't, it's well, that's a separate discussion. Like, is it really going to be positive or negative? On the other hand, it's not like white has to work very hard to just kind of do nothing if he just wants to move his work back and forth. Um, but I just want to the reason I wanted Troy to share his answer as well was because sometimes you could do something like that, just kind of wait around, poke around in your opponent's position, and give them a chance to go wrong. This particular position, I thought it was a little bit too safe for him to kind of do any, um, any sort of error. Um, Uh, lots of people are thinking about this B5 move, trying to force the issue. The thing is, I mean, I'm going to be super lazy. Um, like, what, let's say White just ignores B5. Um, he probably doesn't have to. Um, and he might, yeah, like, but what if he just goes, like, Rook D3? Um, of course, if you play B5 and there's, like, a massive trade on D5, um, I probably would go for that if I can pick up the B pawn, get the D5 outpost. It's probably still not enough to, uh, to win, of course. But that's okay. We don't have to think like, oh, I need to find a winning plan. It's going to take a lot of uh, sort of building blocks to get this to any possible advantage. Um, okay, so B5 is obviously like, uh, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I want to win, let me get a little bit aggressive. Okay, let me call on, where is this gentleman? All right, why not? Let's go to Arnav, who has said he has spotted this already before. But prior knowledge can also be helpful. Hi, Arnav. Mr. Arnoff, 
I have unmuted you. Although, has it really changed you from being unmuted? Oh, you don't have a mic. Okay. All right. Well, he doesn't have a mic, but he does have the right answer. And, um, well, when I say right answer, is the move that I actually played in the game. And I think some people were actually mentioning this earlier, but surprisingly, not in this position. And I played the move G6. Now, might not be good. <laughs> going all the way back to the opening, the reason White even played H4, H5 is this is like, I mean, this has been figured out like 50 years ago. Putting the pawn in H5 is kind of useful for the for several endgame positions where Black's pawns, you know, we call this fixing the pawn structure, where these two H6 and G7 pawns aren't really going to be able to move without, um, you know, causing some damage to the structure. Now, when I play this move G6 here and he takes and I take, um, obviously you can, you can say, hey, I want to play G6 just to create some, like, you know, some action in the position. But um, there is actually a follow-up plan to this that Arnoff also um, uh, laid out to us. So my plan here was when I played this king takes G6, it was actually to play F4, king F5, and get this king a little bit more active, and surprisingly also fix the pawn on G2 as a potential target for my rooks. Now, again, I would be, you know, absolutely wrong to say, yeah, this is like some grandiose winning plan, and now black is just better, and white is going to be desperately struggling. But this is how you turn a position that is, you know, let's say, even as potentially boring and sterile as this one, into one where, you know, your opponent might need to create, you know, might need to find some precise decisions to um, avoid being worse. So here, I also had a follow-up idea. My opponent here played rook d3. And uh, the interesting thing here is that, let's say my opponent was to play a move like g3. So this seems very logical because I was saying, hey, I'm going to go f4, I'm going to go king f5, I'm going to, you know, double the rooks in the g file. So why not just get ahead of the, uh, you know, of the idea and play g3 first? Well, what do you guys think? What do you guys think black should be doing? I'm not even going to put a timer on. Um, I'll let you guys kind of figure it out. Like h5, h4, king h5. Do have to be careful about rook e1 at the right moment. You can also go f4 anyway, right? Takes king f5. And get a past h1. Yeah, I like f4. All right. Seeing uh, some answers from the same people. Maybe I'll call him someone randomly. F4, G, F, H5, H4, and then king comes to F5. So move order very important. F4, Let's see. G, F, and then H5. So we make sure we get the pawn. Please H4. pick me, says Aryan. Okay, let's hear from... F4, G4, possible. I don't know. Let's hear from Darren. Why not? Hello. Hello. So I'm wondering, do you have uh, do you have any potential uh, moves to share with us here if white plays g3? Well, I see that there's a, a possible... Now, suddenly, g4 and f3 could be slightly weaker, so I could somehow try and maybe advance the king there. Maybe in the future. I think it's a little hard to pull off now. Um, the white rooks are liable to just chase you away. But, yeah, maybe in the future, maybe those will be weaknesses. We can dream. Okay, thank you, Darren. Let's see who else we can bring out of the uh, of the dungeon. Arvon? Let's see if I can get him to unmute. Okay, that didn't work. Some of you guys are really trapped in the dungeon. Okay, Bach. How about Bach? I'm trying my best here. Wait. Wait for what? I did call on you. I know some of you guys want to get a... Okay, hold up. Oh, you want you want to go... Okay, back to Yvonne. Here you go. I know some of you guys want to speak, but if you've gotten, you know, one, one, or, one or two chances, then I try to pass it along to someone else. <laughs> no. Oh, man. Tough crowd. Go. Either one of you. I'll just unmute like 10 people and see who goes first. I think that's the only way. I'm just, I'm just going to go around. Charles. Charles, you got something for me? Oh, 
Oh man. I think I think there's got to be some rule. I mean, I know Greg is is, in, is listening in the background. You you gotta there got to be some kind of participation like uh, minimum requirement you got to reach to to be in the class. That's that that's what I'm thinking we got to install here. I could talk, but I think this is. Right, someone just unmuted, the, by the, the way. Students. Oh, it was me. Oh, it was you. Are you gonna participate, Greg? Might as well What's call that? on you. Might as well call on you, Greg. No, don't call on me. I'm a little. I'm doing some work. In the middle of a middle of a bull game. All right, all right, all right. All right, here we go. Finally, someone, someone will rise to the occasion. The hero we need, Evan. But yeah, just just feel free to call on people. I've been calling on people. They they, they just they just uh, they just give me the uh, silent treatment, man. Oh no. I know. No respect around this part you of town. Ask them, you know, ask them questions, see what they say. Hi. All right, Evan. What's up? Um, I'm not I could play F4. Okay. What's that all about? Um, well, I thought I could get the king in the game. What does that mean? Be a little bit more specific. So uh, I thought if like F4, G takes F4, King F4, the king is more active than in like F7 or something. So um, I thought you could, uh, I thought you would get like the king in the game because um, black seems a little um, passive right now. All right, yeah, I mean. Also you may okay. have passed pawn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That 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 was what I was gonna add on. Thank you very much, Evan. And okay, now you guys start messaging me. Oh, I also had a four. Well, listen, it's easy to say that once Evan gives you the answer. I bet you guys are just all copying him. If you wanted the credit, you gotta say it first. Anyway, um, yeah, f4 is definitely uh, uh, the idea here that I had in mind. And of course, if white takes king f5, this extra pawn for white is absolutely irrelevant. Um, the king is completely safe. You cannot sail it with any rooks, of course. And, uh, okay, maybe I don't go king f5 right away. I'd probably even start with h5. But something like this would be awesome with the outside pass pawn. King is very strong. d4 is still a target. And all of a sudden, we've turned a position from, um, you know, oh, this is so boring to, wait, white actually has to be very careful. And it's probably um, probably much worse now. Um, okay. Exactly. There you go. Coast here with the, uh, with the, with the, with the um, you know, very proper rules. All right. So this was an um, uh, important moment of the game. He goes rook d3, I play h5. So at this point, I'm actually considering bringing the pawn to h4 to potentially um, create this g2 uh, pawn for uh, uh, as a target. He plays g3, f4, uh, comes onto the board, rook d2, king f5, so the plan is in motion. And um, I'm not going to make you guys solve for some of these variations. I'll just show you some of the, um, some, of the uh, some potential lines here. Um, so if he plays rook f3 here, which looks like a reasonable idea, um, this doesn't work. Because I was going to play e5, and this is a pretty nice illustrative idea. Um, takes, 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 and there is a nice situation here, a uh, nice thing in the tail, as they call it. If he was to play bishop takes f4, there's this very nice move, king g4, uh, obviously forcing the rook off the square. And let's say rook e3, then we go um, bishop takes f4, and uh, okay, if rook to e4, there's check rook f2. And if pawn takes, even though in this rooking game, white is temporarily up a pawn, h4. It's uh, black is uh, just winning here uh, with rook h8, h3, h2, h1. And uh, yeah, this is one of uh, one example where um, you can see this idea of f4 and h5 kind of coming together. And white really needs to be careful here. Now, if I recall correctly, I'm too lazy to check with the computer. And it doesn't really matter that much. Um, I don't think white's lost here, but he definitely has some very real problems to solve. So if we backtrack even just a little bit to this position where it looks like there's this is move 27, where white plays b3. Um, yeah, it just looks like, okay, we are, you know, in a sterile position. Um, people were, uh, not people, but um, don't mean to pick a new, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Asaria, but he was saying, oh, you know, White's going to crush you like carp. Of, of course, we're just uh, poking a little fun at him. Um, of course, this is absolutely not the case. And all of a sudden, by move, um, what is this? Move 31, four moves later, White's like trying to, trying to, uh, trying to survive. Uh, question, what happens after F4, G3, F4, G4? Um, okay, well, to be honest, after g3, I'm not forced to play f4 immediately. I can also start with h5, I think. So maybe I can play like a f4 at a more proper moment. Uh, that's my answer. Yeah, maybe you have g4 here. That's a good point. Um, but I wanted to just demonstrate this idea of sacrificing an f4. Um, yeah, probably g4 here is good because you can play f3 next. I don't want that to happen. So I most likely just start with h5. But okay, you know, this guy, he's 2300. He needs to figure that out. You know, for me, um, if he figures it out, he gets a draw, um, you know, good for him. 
So, um, okay, so this happens. And here he plays rook to d1. And um, he pl I play e5 here. Okay, so I'm going to fast forward to, uh, you know, because remember, um, unfortunately, I have to show some instructive losses or draws. So obviously, I wasn't able to win this game. And it ended in a draw, right? So let's see what happens. So he takes, uh, I take, he takes, I take, takes, bishop takes e5. Um, I had also seen this back when I played g6, um, although it's not really necessary to, um, to calculate uh, that far. Um, this is something I still had seen. He takes, I take, and now b4. All right. This is your opportunity to get some awesome brownie points and participation points. Uh, you know, par participants will get a grand prize at the end. Um, it's a surprise mystery prize, so we'll, you'll see what it is. Um, all right. Let me throw, I mean, I don't even think this needs a timer, but let's uh, let's throw on a timer here and uh, see what happens. See what happens here. Black to play. <clears throat> Ooh, can these all right, this is a question for everyone passive. i mean all the questions are for everyone but this is a uh, especially for everyone hey japanese tutor let me change some stuff around here real quick c5 makes sense to take some space you also have takes takes b5 you know takes takes b5 white trades a lot and goes king e3 uh, and we don't get the opposition. I kind of like c5 because we, we want to keep the tension on f4. Because if white ever takes on f4, we take with the king and then our h-pawn runs. So it's uncomfortable for white. If they go king c3, our king comes in. So after c5, the only problem with c5, though, is maybe a5 is kind of annoying. So we have to be careful about a5. Well, it's nice to see people are making a... Well, I'm not going to say anything. We got we to gotta wait for... A... Got to wait for all the answers to roll in. Yeah, the, the pawn sacrifice idea is not going to work with white's king so close on d3. If you're trying, like, b5 takes a5, like, no, no. <laughs> Maybe, but a5, then c5. That's the problem. So if you go a5 here, you run into c5. And if you go c5, you run into a5. But actually, c5, a5, we can go b takes a5. And I think black is winning that one. So c5, a5, we go b takes a5, and then if b takes a5, all right, geniuses. We'll go king f5 in that position. We can also just try to play b5 without doing anything. <clears throat> Michael. Actually, I don't want to talk. It's just I accidentally put an X on mark. Yeah, but too bad. You have been called on. Why well, you can't just mute yourself again? That's, you unmute yourself and then you go back to muting yourself. No, I am. I, I am. I am. Uh, I'm. I'm going back to the unmute. Come on. Look, guys. I don't want people to be like, "Oh, that was my move. I saw that." You guys are going to fail all your public speaking classes. Um, who else is here? Who else is here? Now people are just sending me random stuff. All right, let's try this again. Avant, we're back to you. Come on, Avant. Fine, I'll unmute. Uh... I think I was just thinking in this, uh, this, uh, in this one, um, I'd probably play like B five here, and then like try to trade off like. Oh. Well, this is you know, sorry to interrupt, but in in a pawn game, this goes for everyone who is messaging me. In a pawn end game like this, and also almost any pawn end game, it comes down to concrete specifics. So some of you guys are like ah oh, B five, and then I do this and this and this. You got to go move by move. 
Um, it's not very difficult here, but Avon, try to go just move by move. B5, and then what happens specifically? So, B5, uh, let's just say A takes B5 for now. Yep. Uh, then we, we, we play A takes B5. Sure. Uh, I mean, if if C5 or something, then like that pretty much doesn't work because then we just trade off the pawn, then we take opposition and we win. Okay, but so F, so so that line was B5 takes takes C5 takes takes King D5, and then he gives up one of these two squares, and you're going to get the uh, um, you're going to get one of his pawns, right? All right, yeah. so yeah, um, yeah, I mean, there's other lines here, but I mean, all you guys who a lot of you guys had B5, and thank you very much, Yvonne. See, that wasn't so bad. You did it. I'm gonna mute you again. So yeah, b5 here is just an easy win. Um, almost um, the, the problem here for white is that this pawn in f4 is actually huge because it prevents any opposition. At the same time, it's out of the question to make any trade because you give me the outside pass pawn. And if you, um, you kind of can't wait around. If your king goes back anywhere, my king goes forward. Now, it's not a coincidence um, that this is winning for me because I had foreseen this quite some time ago and I went into this position and my whole intention here was to play b5. Now, um, yeah, I got to this position. I had something like, I don't know, five minutes on my clock. Like, not even something unreasonable. It's move 37. So, um, you know, I just need to make a couple moves. I get to move 40. And, um, you know, because uh, this is a time control where you get some bonus time and move 40. Now, why do I even have only five minutes at this point? I don't know. But it is uh, it is what it is. And uh, my whole intention is to play B5. Totally wins. I mean, there's just no variation uh, white can play as a result. I mean, Avon was telling us about c5. If he takes, takes, same issue. Um, he can't make this trade, so the king has to go backwards somewhere, letting me potentially invade. So, again, totally winning. And I literally cannot explain to you what happened, but I've done this. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see, because I, uh, I have some other stuff I'll get to show you guys after this. I know we spent quite some time here, but nevertheless, I played c5. And I remembered when I played c5, I played this move c5, and just, like, my ears turned bright red. I was... I can't really, I, when you guys are older, I'll really tell you what I was thinking when I played C5, but I could not believe I played this move. This was just absolutely insane. So, and the thing is, I was just sitting there. I wasn't even, I don't even know what I was thinking about because I thought down from like five minutes to like 10 seconds, like something absolutely ridiculous. And it's not like I blundered he could play A5. And I was going to say, oh, thankfully some of you guys are also setting me the move C5. It's not like I didn't even see A5. I cannot, I literally cannot tell you why I played this move C5. Literally cannot explain it. So what ends up happening is just absolute nonsense. He plays a5. At this point, I'm not winning anymore. I take, he takes, I take here. This is easier. We get into this ridiculous position. And um, uh, let's see what happens here. So we'll fast forward. I can't take that pawn. I know I'm going faster, but you guys can see I can't take the pawn because of the skewer. So eventually, um, we get to this position where I'm actually up a pawn, but his pawn is more dangerous. So this position is a draw. Um, but it's not an easy draw. So what ends up happening, this is not exactly correct. I uh, remember because uh, this was not an increment time control. Um, so uh, long story short, this game was something like 140 moves, and I ended up losing. Uh, eventually, that pawn uh, became a queen. So this was just one of the most ridiculous days of chess I had, because before this game, I actually was playing um, uh, Eric Hansen, who's a Grandmaster of Canada, and we had like a ridiculously long game, a six hour game, went something like 150 moves or so. And that game ended in a draw. And then I had this back to back game, which was 140 moves. And um, this game I actually ended up losing. So this was by far one of the most ridiculous games off the top of my head that I ever remember losing. And uh, okay, why, why did I want to show it to you guys? Obviously, you know, I'm not like demoralized about this game. Although I will tell you, I remember this tournament was played in Boston. I live in New York. And I remember I had this uh, to drive home. And, um, that was probably the worst drive I've ever had in my life. I just remember, like, you, you got everyone who's lost a bad game of chess, you guys know the feeling. But in general, it was a pretty interesting game. The funny thing is, I remember I was playing this game. I was like, damn, this is such a nice game. I am so nice. I can't wait to get back home. I'm going to win this game, win the tournament. I'm going to get back, show all my students my game, ask for a raise. It's going to be amazing. And then I just do the absolute purest, dumb possible moves possible. But... Um, yeah, in general, I quite like this G6 idea. Then there was this H5 at four. And um, uh, of course, it was just such a, such a pity that I ruined it when I could have played B5. Okay, but now moving on, I, have a, I promised that, um, was I ever winning? Someone said, yeah, of course. I was completely winning right here. Here, throw on the computer. Um, so, um, yeah, B5. I, got, I got some stuff to show you. And I promised I have something to show you guys. Um, 
that no one has seen here because people are like, I've seen this before. That's okay. I will, what does it say here? It's only minus eight guys. I'm not sure if it's winning. Uh, okay, let me remove this. Okay, let me show a recent game here as well. Okay. New board, new game, new, um, new adventures. Let me just re reassemble my screen. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to fast forward this game for a moment because there's some stuff happens here that's not exactly uh, relevant. We'll get to we'll get to this position. Um, okay, yeah. So this is a game that I played um, like something like five days ago or something, and um, I was just playing at a, at a, a over the board norm event in Charlotte. So in this tournament, there were ten uh, ten players, nine rounds. Everyone plays each other. And uh, everyone in the field was uh, more or less either an international master or a grandmaster. And uh, I was playing a fellow international master, the young Abhimanyu Mishra, who is, um, you know, very, what is it, something like the youngest I am in world history. So he has many great uh, things to come. But in any case, um, for now, um, you know, before he becomes a GM and all that stuff, we can still bully him around, or at least I can. And um, anyway, this is our position. So... Um, I'm up a pawn. He sacrificed the pawn earlier in the game, but it's not really a particularly useful pawn here. As you guys can see, I have four isolated pawns. Now, that's not really, um, you know, saying too much, but it's like almost impossible to use them. And uh, this position is very likely heading to some kind of draw. Um, you know, my rook here is doing a good job of doing some protection, uh, protecting two of these uh, targeted weaknesses. But in general, it's like almost impossible to move any of them. So he plays knight c2, um, going around to e3 or d4. And here I play uh, rook b6, so preemptively getting my rook out of any possible forks. Uh, he plays knight e3, and I play knight e7 to defend the pawn. And now he plays rook to d2. Um, okay, so this is not that important to ask about this, so I'll just show you guys what I did. So he's targeting the pawn on d5, but I ignore it and play the move rook a8. And of course, the idea here is I don't want to just sit passively. I'm trying to get some kind of activity um, on to, uh, on the queen side. So here, um, okay, I'm going to do a little bit of a short test with you guys. I'm going to give you guys one minute. So not a lot of time. And just tell me what you would play for white and go time. I guess I would think about C4, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, white to play. You could go B4, but then that weakens the C3 pawn. So on B4, black will play like rook A3. If we take on d5, then black will take twice, and eventually black takes right. on b2. So black. I purposely gave you guys only one minute. It was not mandatory for me to put you in that time trouble, but I'm I wanted to test something here. Okay, so most players here seems to have played very solid. We have uh, rook f2. Most people, completely fine move. Um, okay, so I'll tell you why I asked you this, and also what he played, and what happened in the game. Now, at this moment, um, basically, had he played almost any move here and offered me a draw, I would have probably just taken it. I was actually thinking of just offering a draw myself at this point, because, um, yeah, there's just no, not really too many ways to make any progress for Black here. But, incredibly, he plays the move that, um, a player here in the chat here is very excited about, has sent it to me three times in a row, with two exclamps to boot. So he must be very confident in this move. And uh, that is the move Abhimanyu played. So on one hand, you're playing like the youngest I am in the world. But on the other hand, you are also making a mistake. So, uh, you know, take that for what it's worth. He played knight takes d5 here, and he offered me a draw. And um, 
Um, I'll tell you why, you know, I thought that was a little bit strange. So basically in this position, well, let's see what happens. A knight takes d5, takes, 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 rook takes. We are in a rook end game and um, I'm up a pawn. We'll get to this position in a moment. But what did he do when he traded on d5? He liquidated my very weak pawn on d5, which is under, you know, much duress here for this pawn on b2 and also gave me this rook on the second rank. Now that position is still a draw and we'll get to it in a moment. But yeah, something like rook, I mean, I, let's see like the top like five best moves here. You got g4, rook f2, bishop f3. It's literally like any move in the position, like basically any move in the position is just all zeros. Rook b1, even c4, because he maybe, I guess he has rook b7, uh, rook d7, excuse me. But he plays this move knight takes d5. And this is just a separate conversation I also want to kind of have. Um, yeah, a lot of the times when, the reason I gave you guys one minute is that a lot of times when players under are under time trouble or don't have a lot of time to, um, you know, well, same thing, don't have you know a lot of time to decide on their move, it's very natural to go for something very forcing. Um, so let me just clarify the position. It's very easy to calculate knight d5, knight d5, bishop d5, rook d5, rook b2, and, uh, you know, so forth. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of the times when you go for these forcing continuations, they might be detrimental, you know, they might be easy to play but, and easy to calculate, but they are also potentially detrimental to your position. So that's like a very common thing. When someone's in time trouble, obviously they look at forcing moves. And a lot of times they also do trades and exchanges that are dubious. I've talked about this before, and this works for both sides. This can be your opponent, and this can also be um, yourself. So he takes ND5, and I just take back. He takes, I take, Rook takes B2. And of course, there's also, why would I ever accept a draw now? Like, okay, maybe I don't have to take a draw in the other position as well. But in this position, certainly, um, okay, I'm up a pawn. I will never lose, and I'll do my best to, uh, to, to, to create some kind of chances. And immediately, I think he makes a second mistake when he plays this move rook f2. Now, it's very natural to try to trade this rook off, but uh, I thought this was actually not the best, because after I play rook to a2 and he trades off, now he's stuck mm -hmm. with this king cut off. And we both had maybe um, a couple minutes at this point. And, um, okay, is this position winning? I doubt it because it's way too simplified. But um, I was quite happy. I was like, oh, great. You know, I get a free push here. And it's not those types of rook end games, like three on two, that not are necessarily easy white. to draw. For sure. Um, I mean, this should be a relatively simple question. But how do you guys think Black is going to try to win here? What is sort of the winning plan here for Black? So winning plan would be to try to get the king into f3 or something. But that's very hard to do because... White is going to put the rook on d4 and cut the king off. So. What to do? We definitely don't want to lose our b pawn. <clears throat> Give me some more, like, moves, not just, like, words. Yeah, not so easy. Um... Um, yeah, sure. Why not? Austin. Uh, so I said King G6. And so the rook currently is cutting off the king. So we can use the point to block the rook and then just march the king out. Yeah, I mean, simple as that. Um, you know, if he doesn't uh, do anything about it, which is surprisingly difficult to do so, yeah, I just want to go King G6, F5, King G5, King G4, hopefully pick up the spawn. Obviously, there's going to be some adventures to do that. But, um, yeah, I mean, in general, any endgame, uh, as long as your pieces are more active than your opponents, then you're going to be in good shape. If you're ahead, obviously, that's probably going to give you the win. If you're behind and you have more, you know, if his king was at F3, this would be an absolutely simple draw because I can never get to this pawn. His rook is going to do a good job of protecting and harassing my pawn as a result. Maybe he'll even use his king more offensively. But because his king is cut off, of course his rook is not so bad. But my rook is still, I would say, more dominant. My king is more free. I think that this gave me very fair winning chances. And, okay, this is still a draw, to be fair. Yeah, sure. But one other thing here, the other mistake he made when he took on d5 is that sometimes um, it's very tempting to just simplify. and Like, okay, let me go into this endgame where I can make a draw. But there's a difference between... 
it being possible to make the draw and it being objectively drawn with best play and also having to do it practically. So I just was really like going back to this knight d5, was very surprised by that whole decision. So what happens next? Uh, rook c5, king g6, I go f5, all according to plan, h6 to get out of this thing. Now I want to move my king up. Um, he goes c4, king h5 first because of king g5, he goes check. So I go king h5, he cuts my king off. Uh, I play b6, so again, removing the pawns from the target of the rook. And at the right moment, I might start to harass these pawns. And that's kind of what happens. King g1, rook b4. Now my king goes up the board. So I'm going to fast forward to a position. So we got to this one uh, here. I made some progress. Obviously, my king is all the way down the board. I've also um, traded off. Um, okay, it would be better if I won the g-pawn for free. But I've also traded off the um, you know the g-pawn for the f-pawn, uh, for the h-pawn. By the way, one thing I was going to add, why is this position still a draw despite all these advantages? The truth is, even if I win both of these pawns for this pawn, it's still a draw. H and F against the king, uh, H and F pawns in a rookie game is um, is a draw. But, um, of course, you know, whatever. Like, he has to defend that. And, of course, I'm going to try to push that forever. So, but this, this just kind of shows you the drawing margin here is quite high for white. But, you know, it's a different story when you have to do it in person. Okay, so king g4, we make this trade. And here I was sure that I was winning. I wasn't necessarily sure how. But um, without these pawns, this is a draw. And you guys will see that in a moment. Um, so, for example, okay, I'll fast forward here. I didn't play king e2 here. This is a typo. I would not have just given up this pawn. Um, so, I, um, so here, here. Um, yeah, so I go check and king f2, and he plays c5. Now, the reason if it's a draw without these pawns, in case uh, you guys don't know this, this is called short side, long side. So what that means is that this board is bisected into two, and this king is on what we call the short side because there's only two files here, and, this, and the rook is on, you know, the long side. You got the idea. And the reason this is a draw here is because the rook is going to be giving me all these annoying checks. So I think a lot of you guys probably know this already. But for example, something like this is not really winnable for me. Um, you know, I have to stay by my pawn. If I chase the rook, he goes rook a2. And this king is always close enough to kind of corral the pawn before it promotes. And the rook is extremely annoying giving these checks. So this is the general drawing technique. If you're able to get your rook to the quote unquote long side and keep this proper checking distance, it's going to be a draw. Um, here, obviously, there's not enough checking distance if it was on the opposite side, because then the king would just step forward and promote the pawn. So I need to keep these pawns on the board. Now, he plays c5, I play b5, he plays rook b6, f3, let's thread in some checkmate, he goes king to h3 to stop it, and um, here, uh, king g1, um, then um, I'm threatening f2, f1, so he has to go uh, pawn c7, rook, he, uh, rook c4, rook takes um, b5, f2. Okay, this is... Your last assignment of the day. I'm going to give you a nice solid five minutes here. And um, I want you to try to calculate out the end game. So it's white to play here. Um, I'm starting from here to make it maximally challenging. So you have to calculate as many moves as possible in your head. Um, maybe some of you actually know this. I didn't know it. Um, so then all the more power to you. So it's, um, it's white to play here, but black wins uh, in the long run. So I'll give you five minutes. This is an easy win. Okay, good job, buddy. All right, so let's rock and roll. So white to move. I mean, it seems like rook uh, g5 check is kind of only move here. Rook g5, if king h1, we go rook f5. But then black has rook c3 check, king g4, king g2. Rook g5 check, king h1, rook f5, rook c3 check. Rook c3 check, very painful. King has to go to the fourth rank, and then black goes king g2. And we're losing the pawn. Oh, so let's say rook g5 check, king h1, rook f5. Rook c3 check, white goes king h4. Not king g4, king h4. Then king g2, we have rook g5 check.
King H2, Rook F5. Oh, this is a famous study. I've seen this before. I think, I think it's a well-known study. Then it goes back Rook F5, Rook C4 check. Now Black's King is on H2, King H5, King G2, Rook G5 check, King H3, Rook F5. Then how does black actually win that one? Maybe at some point we just go back to F1 and then Oh, rook g5 checking f3. Well, still white is going to have checks. Rook f5 check. The king moves over to the e file. You just wait with the rook. Maybe king is going to e3. I think you're right, though. I think when the king moves over, if white's king is like somewhere on h5, then it's just going to be winning. I mean, king can even. Hide on f1 at some point. Well, that's a cool idea. So rook g5 check, king h1, rook f5, rook c3 check, king h4, king g2, rook g5 check, king h2, rook f5, rook c4 check, king h5. King g3. But then we're not threatening to queen. So white is just going to go rook f7 there. Or give check, actually. No, no, check, king f4, right. So white goes rook f7. Then we can go rook c5, check. Push the king back. King h6. Oh, rook takes c7. Yeah, we just take on c7. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, flag master. Yeah. When white goes rook f7, we just take on c7. And then we get queen versus rook. I mean, it's definitely not easy. I mean, the only person who has the answer is the person who saw the answer beforehand. Um, but I would have given you guys more than five minutes, but it's also, um, it's like instructive to learn this anyway. So I wasn't really concerned whether or not one of you guys was going to find it. There is someone who's very close to solving it though. I think the beginning is quite, uh, it's quite, um, you know, not obvious, but there's like really not a lot of moves here. All right, let's uh, I'll, I'll let I'll let uh, I'll let denial start it up. Hello. Hello. Uh, All right, so you had this variation. Um, um, can you take us through it? Yeah, I realize now what I don't know what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> no, but it was it was still, the the start was correct. So let's 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 use that as a jumping point. So I guess rook g five, king h one, rook f five. Um, and now you can push the king away with rook c3, king h4, king g2, rook g5, king, oh sorry, king g2, rook g5, king h2, rook f5. And then I thought rook c4 check, king h5. I yeah, so. Some trick, I guess, with like rook c5, but I don't see how there's something like that, I'm assuming. Yeah, so um, let's let's kind of go through that again. Um, like I said, so I put this position up, and people are sending. I'm like, here, you guys get five minutes, and people just send me one move, and they're just like, boom, I'm done. It's <laughs> you know, that's like I'm not going to. I mean, I, I've said this before, and this is true not just for me, but any like any time you're like with any coach or in any lesson, if you get like a lot of time, like okay, there's two situ situations. Either 
you know, the coach gives you plenty of time to solve, you know, like a one move problem, which is just never going to happen. Or, you know, or maybe you're wrong. So keep that in mind. But anyway, so uh, rook g5 check, king h1, rook f5. This is forced because he needs to stop the pawn. Then black has this idea to go check, king goes to h4, and you need to keep the king on the h file if you're playing white because you always need to have the g file to give a check. So again, rook g5, king h1, rook f5, rook c3 check, king h4, king g2 threatens f1, rook g5 check, king h2, rook f5, rook c4 check, king h5. And that's where... Um, uh, Denial's line kind of went to, and he said, originally he sent me that, and he was like, okay, this is the pattern. I'm going to force this king all the way down to h7, and then it's going to be, um, you're going to be able to capture on c7. And he's right, but it's going to take a little bit of work to do that. So how are we going to accomplish this? So check, king h4, king g2, check, king h2, uh, rook f5. Um, now we go check again, king goes to, um, um, to h5. Uh, and now we can go, um, King to g2, rook g5, and it looks like we're stuck because, you know, you go to the h file, just go back. But here comes the key idea. You actually go king f1 first, which creates the threat of taking on c7. Now, earlier we saw a situation where this was a draw because oh, white had short nice side, long side. So, but that was when the king was all the way in h2. So here, if you try some, something like that again, it just doesn't work, obviously, because I just go king to uh, g2. If the king was in h2, this would actually still be a draw because I can give you all these checks on the a file. That I know this from a book. Um, we'll see. So, <laughs> yeah, so here, king f1. Um, rook has to go back to g7. And now we restart the pattern. King to e2, check. King to f3, check. King g3, check. King h3. And now you can go check. Very important. You force the king to h6. And um, now, here after king g3, white's actually in Zugzwag. Because... Uh, if you get, if you you have to maintain the rook to uh, protect the uh, the promotion square, you have to maintain the rook to um, protect the pawn. So the only move you can really do here is, I mean, you can do other stuff, but I mean, you can't move your king to the g file because I go king g two. So you have to try this check, or I guess this is the critical line, king h four, and now finally you get here. So very long line, very long line. It's wow. not so obvious. Obviously, you guys who saw this checking idea. Um, um, you kind of figure it out, okay, if you're winning, this must be the way to kind of get it done. But, um, yeah, I wish this happened in the game, but it really didn't. It really did not happen. Yeah, I'm sure, like, Very it nice looks time. like a study. I'm sure this is, like, a concept that's definitely in some kind of, uh, some kind of endgame. Oh, yeah, and by the way, you guys are right. After that, you have to win queen versus rook, and I've never had to do that. There's, like, one key position you have to know, and I know it, so I for hopefully would have been able to convert that. But, this game has the lamest finish ever. Um, <laughs> so I tricked every, I tricked all of you guys here. Um, in this position, Lasker. Lasker had to study like. This. In this position, oh man! So you guys saw that last game where I didn't play b5, and um, I instead played that ridiculous move c5. So here I get to this position. I have just played f3. I have just played rook b4. I had calculated this position. I had completely intended to play king g1 here. King g1. Now, obviously, I didn't see that victory. Um, and, you know, would I have won the game? Um, I didn't play King G1, as you can tell. I think so, because there's just not that many moves for me to play here. So I feel like I would have figured it out. Um, although, you know, I can say whatever I want, because I can just speculate. Maybe I would have hung my rook and lost the game. Who knows? <laughs> but incredibly here, I... Um, no, he played King H3. He didn't blunder me. Incredibly here, in this position, I, I got down to, like, a couple seconds, and my, my hand... Not my brain. My hand makes the powerful move king e3. And I made this move and I was like, wait a minute. Why did I just go king e3? This makes no sense. So you guys can, can, can sense a pattern here. And of course, the game just ends in a draw in the way that I earlier kind of described that you can get into this short side, long side situation. All right. So what's the lesson here? Well, I'm not sure. The previous game I lost. This game I drew. So I guess we are improving or I am improving. So uh, take that for what you will. Um, but... I did, you know, I did think this endgame was very interesting, so I did want to share it, especially that ridiculous idea. But yeah, of course, anyone here who has played, um, you guys know that sometimes when, I have so many examples like this of when I've had a couple seconds on the clock, I just do some of the most brain-dead possible moves. Um, and uh, this is just adding to the collection. Maybe one day I'll publish a book, you know, my, my 60 most memorable brain-dead games, and this is definitely going to be one of them. Uh, maybe, maybe like game number 11 in the book or so. Um, and the other game is definitely going to be like the, the Mona Lisa of, of that collection that I just showed you guys. <laughs> but, um, 
yeah, two end games, two uh, unfortunate results, and um, you know, was I guess don't get into a don't get into time trouble is, is the ultimate lesson. But anyway, uh, I thought these end games were pretty interesting, and I wanted to to share them with you. Oh.